Hey everybody, welcome back to the Frugal Filmmaker Q&A, the show where you ask me a question and I make something up on the spot. If you'd like your question read on the show, please send me an email at thefrugalfilmmaker at gmail.com. It's the best chance you have of getting your question read on the show, or you can comment below, or you can send me a message on Twitter, at Frugal Filmmaker. My video last week was all about this. I called this the Itsy Bitsy Slider. It's essentially a very small slider that runs along a 10-inch rail. And this is actually made from a free sample obtained from IGUS, the company that makes these parts, high quality parts. Okay, let's get on to our questions. Our first one is from email, and this is from uh, Alexander Bouchard, who says, since this past Monday was the first of the month, and you didn't announce a Trivia Monday contest, am I to assume that this has gone by the wayside? No, this hasn't gone by the wayside. I plan on doing Trivia Monday again. I actually forgot about it until after the episode, and I realized, oh, it's Trivia Monday. However, I think the reason I forgot was because I've been pulling all of my resources together so that I could produce this, my next short film. And part of the budget for this came out of the budget for the Trivia Monday contest, which granted isn't very much, it's only about $15, but I'm sort of trying to buy props and stuff that I want to use in this movie. Uh, it's my next short called The Bullet for Roger. It's kind of a neo-noir, film noir homage that's set, homage, excuse me, that's set in a contemporary time, but has sort of retro 40s feel to it. So. I needed some money to sort of put into this project, and so that's where the Trivia Monday money went. Our second question via email is from Daniel Rinke, who says, I'm having a heck of a time trying to record audio. I'm really new at this. Basically, I have no clue how to hook up my microphone to my camera. The plugs are different, and it's confusing. What Daniel is trying to do is to hook up an XLR mic, like this connection here, to an eighth-inch mic input like this. Obviously, these two are not compatible. They don't work together, so you need some kind of an adapter. The easiest one is just an XLR to 8th inch adapter. They're about $8 to $10. I can leave a link below in the description. And things just get more fancy and more expensive from there. You can also use something like this. It's an XLR interface that comes out in an 8th inch connection like this. You can plug into your camcorder or whatever camera you have. I use this connection uh, all the time to do these type of things. Just shot a big event with this stuff over the weekend. Uh, these are great. These are more expensive. They're like $150. This is one from Sign Video, I believe. I've been using it for about 10 years. It's built like a tank. It works well. It's a passive mixer as well. and some other features like a ground loop adjustment and stuff like that. But it's going to cost more money. And Beach Tech sells one. And you can just keep going up and up and up. There's also the iRig Pre, which is an XLR box you plug in and it goes into your camera as well. But it's a preamp, so it eliminates kind of the negative effects that your cameras, your cheap camera preamp might have by making a better preamp before it goes in. So you can turn the one on the camera down really low. There's all sorts of options. It depends on how much money you want to spend. Okay, our next email is from Vincent Serena who says, I would like to know some places you go to get cameras and other film gear at reasonable prices. I basically go three places to get camera stuff on the internet. I go to eBay, I go to Amazon, and I go to B&H Photo Video. It all depends on where the best price is. I'm actually an affiliate for all three of those places, so if you don't mind going through my links, whether on my blog or any link you see in the description of any video I produce, uh, and get something through those links, I'll actually make a little percentage that will help keep this production afloat. Our next question comes from comments from our last week's Q&A video. The first one is from Aniston the First, who says, I've been looking into vintage lenses mostly because of their affordable price tag. However, with the lenses being completely manual and lacking image stabilization, are they really worth looking into for video and photography work? I think the answer to this question is yes, with an asterisk. I think vintage glass is great. Many of you know that I'm a big proponent of vintage lenses. I think they're well made. I think they have lots of character. I think they'll last a long time. You can use them on any camera. They are relatively inexpensive. You can find lots of them on eBay in really good condition. However, Aniston here has a very good point, which is that they don't have image stabilization. So if you're doing any kind of handheld work, and I've had this experience myself, due to the fact that you probably have a rolling shutter built into your camera, you're going to get a real fluttery kind of picture if you try and shoot handheld because you don't have image stabilization. I've experienced this, which has just led me to use vintage lenses only on a lockdown camera, which doesn't mean it can't move around. It just means it has to be on a dolly or something else. But shooting handheld creates a very unpleasant image, I've noticed. So that's the asterisk. I don't like that at all. And the only way really to remedy this is to use a camera that has a global shutter, which doesn't have rolling shutter which is just more stable and locked down and this won't be a problem. You can also sometimes fix it in post, but I haven't had a whole lot of luck doing that. Okay, finally we have a great question from DSLR Guide who says, how much would you say the technical side of filmmaking matters as a percentage of an entire film? I'm talking gear, production value, etc. This is a great question. I thought about this for a while after I read it because it's really, it's really perplexing because you think, okay, how much of your movie depends on the technical side and how much relies on something else, something more nebulous or more mysterious. 
Uh, you can kind of see it in older movies where you see how the dolly shots weren't exactly smooth compared to newer movies where they're using steady cams or everything's really, really smooth or whatever, and everyone has perfected their craft, and you go back, back in time and things are a little bit bumpier, sometimes they're out of focus, uh, but it doesn't affect the quality of the movie, which I think is the most important lesson I think I take from this question, is that technical prowess is great and you want your movie to be as technically competent as possible. However, if it isn't, your movie doesn't necessarily have to suffer for the most part. I think there's an exception to this rule, which is sound. I think you have to have good sound and nobody's gonna forgive you if you have bad sound because it's the sign of an amateur. So always make sure that you have good sound uh, because the visual things you can tend to forgive and I think evidence of this, you know, the whole found footage genre is evidence of this, but notice there the sound is always good, even in those movies. Uh, but you can focus on the details of the intangibles, uh, details about character, details about story, uh, you can work with actors and get better performances. Uh, you can focus on production design, costuming, hair and makeup, things like that. So I think ultimately it's really hard for me to nail down a percentage of, the t of what is technical and what is non-technical because I think it also depends on what kind of film you're making. If you're doing just an indie drama, I think that the actual technical side of it is maybe lessened because maybe you're using a lot of natural light, maybe you're using your house to shoot in, maybe you're using your iPhone to shoot, whatever. Versus say something like a special effects science fiction extravaganza. Obviously the technical side of that is gonna have a lot more influence and you're gonna to have to have a lot more of the technical side in order to pull your movie off. So it kind of all depends on what you're making. This is a very kind of difficult question to answer as far as percentage goes. For me personally, I think the non-technical outweighs the technical because I think the writing and story and characters and performances and little details you put into your production design and hair and makeup and things like that, I think are more important in a movie versus what kind of camera you're using, what kind of microphone you're using. Obviously those things are important and obviously you need them in your production to make a movie, uh, but I don't think they're the most important thing. So I think the percentage of that as far as making a quality film is less, at least for movies that I make. Now, if, again, if you're making some kind of science fiction epic, those requirements are gonna be bigger and you're gonna need more post-production and you're gonna need more prep and you're gonna need more green screen techniques, et cetera, et cetera. So look at the movie you're making and I guess make that determination. But I'd be curious to see what you guys think out there about this question because it is a very interesting one. So please comment below. Okay, that's all the time we have this week. I appreciate everyone's letters and emails and comments. And again, if you'd like your question read on the show, please send me an email at thefrugalfilmmaker at gmail.com. You can also make a comment below or you can send me a message on Twitter at frugalfilmmaker. We'll have another video this Thursday or Friday and then we'll have a Q&A the following Monday. We'll see you then. Bye.